I didn't do them. The Lord really did them. And uh, we're, if, if you haven't read um, Benny Johnson's book, The Power of Communion, I would definitely suggest that you get that. Uh, get that book, start reading that book. You're going to find a lot of the things that we've been able to share from that is actually from that template. So if you've got your Bibles this morning, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm getting there myself. This has been, in our, this has been a, just the foundational verse for this series. One more page. Here we go. I got it. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm going to start in verse 23, for this is Paul speaking to the Corinthian church, for I have received from the Lord that what I also passed to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this is, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, we are proclaiming, or you are proclaiming, the Lord's death until he comes. So we've been here for about three weeks. And, and I'm just a quick recap this morning. Uh, we talked about the covenant and the blood. And that was week one. And I mean, that was powerful. And last week we talked about really the covenant as it applies to the bread, specifically with healing in our bodies, our hearts, our minds, those things. This week we're talking about the posture of communion. There is a posture of our heart that has to be present in communion. And I'm going to give you three postures, at least three. There's probably more than three. Can, can we say that this is not an exhaustive concordance on the postures of our hearts towards the presence of the Lord? All right, if you've ever seen or you've ever been a part of 970 Church, there are times where God moves and people just do things differently. Don, Don said it this morning, sometimes it gets a little weird. Now here's, here's what the reality is this. I am not giving you permission to be weird. You're in the wrong, you're in the wrong house this morning. Okay? There are other... You can be peculiar. The Bible gives you permission to be peculiar. You are peculiar people. You're, there's something different about you. And we celebrate those differences in the name of Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Praise God. You will see an expression of people sometimes that they come into the presence of the Lord and they just get really happy. Amen. There are some people, they're just overwhelmed by His presence and they just have what we like to call unscheduled carpet time. All right? Or sometimes they had scheduled carpet time. It was scheduled in heaven. They just didn't get the memo. That's fine. There are some people, they're just going to lift their hands, they're going to close their eyes and they're just going to quietly celebrate the presence of the Lord to themselves. And there's nothing wrong with that expression either. There are some people, they turn around and they make a chair, their, their prayer altar. And I don't know that I would do that on this hard concrete floor, but if your knees can do it, praise the Lord. Maybe you just got new knees from the Lord and that's your altar of praise. Amen. Right? That's happened too. Um, we're, we're okay with what that expression is as long as it's not disruptive to what the Holy Spirit wants to do. And as long as it's not out of order with what, with what this Holy Spirit wants to do in the service, amen? In other words, resist the urge to go into business for yourself. <laughs> is, that, is that okay? Did everybody receive that? I mean, hands out, I receive that right now in the name of... Let's not go into business for ourselves with the Lord. We don't... He, let me put it this way. He doesn't need our help in order to make His name great but he certainly doesn't mind using us to do so. And the testimony of, of what God has done is incredibly important. So we're going to get there in a few minutes, but I want to say it now. And that as we break out into groups or families for communion this morning, maybe some of you need to share a testimony of what God's done in your life. And so I want to make sure that during communion that, that you get the opportunity to share testimony with communion. Amen. All right, let's keep going. This morning, there are three postures I just want to highlight that, that Paul, Paul tells us. He says, first off, I want you to have a posture in your heart. Let's define what posture is. And when I say posture of the heart, it's in a way that doesn't move us into fear because of sin. When Paul says, I want you to take a minute. Let me, let me just make, let me go back and read this, make sure I have it said correctly. It's in verse 27. 
uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. So we ought to examine ourselves, right, before we eat of the bread and drink the cup. This is not just a sin check. Go back and think about week one. We talked about making sure that our hearts are in a place of covenant renewal before the Lord every time we take communion. Amen? Here's the thing that I want us to understand. Communion is not just about eating the bread, drinking the cup. It's not just about using God, quote unquote, as a vending machine and I'm going to take communion until I get my healing. That's not it. It's a covenant relationship. And here's the thing. In covenant relationship, it is this. Are you ready? It's not difficult, but I want you to write it down. It is a relationship. It is not, I know you're like, Pastor John, you need more time for points. No, it's, it's got to be simple. It's got to be simple. We, the Bible says that we all like sheep have gone astray. I've never met a smart sheep. Sheep, is that the, that's both the singular and the plural, right? I've never met a smart sheep, right? Sheep, you can't say ship. It's a sheep. Sheep him. No, let's just, let's just go with I've never met a smart sheep. Amen. It can't be complicated. And a covenant relationship with the Lord is anything but complicated. And here's what happens. We let the enemy minister frustration, anxiety, and complication to us because we start to believe inside of a lie that we're not worthy. The whole premise of him coming was to move us from sinner to saint, from slave to son. I've said this on Wednesday night. I've said it on Sunday morning. Don't just get stuck in the friend zone. He died for more than you to be in the friend zone with him. Come on. on. All right, enough of that. There's a posture. Here's the scandal of grace. It's that Jesus never required perfection in order for us to come to him. Don said it this morning, and he didn't even know what we were talking about. When he, said, when he said, God loves us and he doesn't wait for us to get our stuff together, I received that. Yes, amen. Right? Some of us need to just realize this this morning. The Lord's not waiting on us to come to him after we've gotten our stuff together. I want to tell you right now, it will never be together enough to come to him. Amen. You're believing a lie. Don't believe the lie. What, come to him and let him help you get your stuff together. Come on. Right? Let, let him minister that ministry, this, my, this is my wife's message, right? She loves the ministry of administration and order, right? Yeah, I know. Some of you are like, I'm out, pastor. I can't do that. This is, I, this is for her, not for me, right? She loves to organize. She loves for things to be in their own box, in their own place. How many of you, that's you? There's a gift for you in the kingdom. There is a place for you at 970 Church. It's it's every place behind me where I've made a mess. Amen. (laughs) The scandal of grace, I love this, is that Jesus never required perfection from us in order for us to come to him. Fear is never productive. It gets in the way of love's transforming power. Okay, I'll say that again. Fear and a fear check, okay, a fear check is what some of us like to call a sin check sometimes. And I would, you're in the right vein because if we'll treat fear like a sin, we might get delivered from it. All right, well, I can just tell by your overwhelming response. That went over. Maybe we should stay there for a minute. Fear is never productive. And if we would treat fear like a sin... Right? We'll get delivered from it. Amen. It's in way, fear stands in the way of love's transforming power. Mm-hmm. And we want to posture our hearts away from fear. And our first posture that we want to take is we want to posture ourselves soberly. Soberly. S-O-B-E-R-L-Y. We want to posture our hearts soberly when we take communion. We want to t- intentionally take communion in a way that helps us to create space in our hearts for the Holy Spirit to move and transform. So if we're taking communion and we have an encounter presence of God, we have just congratulations, had a snack, and called it communion. That is not it. We, oh, you're like, oh, wait a minute, what happened here? No, let's call a duck a duck. 
Okay? If we've come into take communion and we're not encountering His presence, we had a snack. And we called it communion. That's not it. That's going through the motions. That's not taking time. That's not posturing our hearts correctly. Right? Now, some of us, we would do the same thing with prayer. If we come into prayer, right, and we pray for 45 minutes and we don't leave changed, we didn't pray, we complained. I'll just say it at the wall so that no one gets offended. Come on. That, listen, the reason I'm saying it is I'm stomping on my own toes. How many of you are going through something right now? Just raise your hand. Sure, wait, raise it high. How many of you have taken that thing before the Lord? How many of you took, took that thing back with you when you left God? <laughs> so we made our prayer. I did it too. Dad's right. How many of you know we, that wasn't praying, that was complaining about the thing because we took it back from him? <laughs> Whoops. No, listen, when I take something to him, I've got to have the discipline to leave it there. Amen. Right? And I've got to say, Lord, I trust you with this. And when I feel tempted to take it back, it's this statement of declaration. Nope, I gave that to you and I trust you with it. And is there anything I can do to help speed this along? Yeah, keep your heart right and your attitude out of that. Okay. That, how many of you know that doesn't mean I'm working towards something. I have to trust him with it and leave it there, which removes me from being able to advance this by me physically bringing something to the table. Kind of like being perfect. Oh. Well, I'm not done offending everyone in the room yet, so let's keep going. We want to take communion soberly. Here's what we want. When we participate in communion, it is, it is important that there be a sense of soberness and not, not somber, sober. That's why I spelled it, sober. S-O-B-E-R, not somber, S-O-M-B-E-R. Sober means I am thinking correctly about the situation i am thinking about the king of kings and lord of lords and being in covenant with him right i am not trying to turn communion into a somber attitude where it, where listen to me on the night of communion was the, was the night before our greatest victory in the name of jesus come on I don't need to be somber about it. I'm taking, I'm taking communion, and I, I, didn't, I, don't, I didn't put this in this message, but it certainly is, it is this in this message, and that communion is an act of warfare. Because what you're doing is you're declaring that the body and the blood of Jesus that established a new covenant for us means the old covenant was dead and gone. It means there's no, no such thing as the law of law the law anymore because it was completed with the law of grace with the Lord it also means and it reminds the enemy of his greatest failure you tried you tried but you didn't win that, and that's an act of warfare all right let's stay on the notes right sober is and we are in touch with this sense of gravity Watch, we have a good Father who is incredibly full of grace, but we never want to lose sight of His holiness or His power. The same Jesus who said, let the little children come to me, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 14, right, Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these, right, is the same Jesus who's described in Revelation chapter 1, verse 14 with this, his head and his hair were white like wool and white hair white as snow and his eyes were like a blazing fire. It's not either or, it's both and. Come on, right? Sober reverence is a healthy reaction when we remember the body and the blood of Jesus, right? Okay, just, I'm right on this. You just, just say yes. Okay, number two. Sometimes you have to amen yourself, Right? We want to take communion with sober, soberly. We want to take communion thankfully. Come on. That's why I had, I had to go pull that song when I think about the Lord. I had to go, I had to go on YouTube. Don't do it. Do, save yourself the Google search. 
because the earliest version I believe we found was somewhere in the mid-80s. Everybody's hair horrible. Everybody's sundress is off. I mean, good grief. Let's, let's leave that there. Amen. Right? Um, and I, had to apo- I apologized to Don when I sent it to him. I said, this was the best version I could find. So please excuse the, uh, the early 90s look to which, to which he laughed. But it, it simply says this, when I think about the Lord... And then it it goes into a time of remembering because remembering produces thankfulness. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, right? How he saved me to the uttermost. I'm not going to get the words right. That's why I'm not the worship leader. (laughs) It makes me want to shout. What? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory and all the praise. And then we go, it makes me want to shout. And everybody kind of like, should we sing it again? Why not? Let's keep singing. I know some of you are like, ooh, we should sing it again. No, we're not doing that right now. We come to the Lord thankfully. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 through 18 reads like this. He says, rejoice always. Pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Gratitude, our gratitude specifically, is a response. And when the Bible says to be thankful, no matter the circumstance, this is not expecting us to create an emotion out of thin air. That's why I'm telling you right now, for us, gratitude has to be a response. When he says give thankful, put it up there for us again, Eric, Give thanks in all circumstances. Does that say give thanks in the good circumstances? No. Does it say I give thanks in the bad circumstances? Does it say give thanks in what kind of circumstances? All of them. In the good ones and in the bad ones. Right? This is why this next verse is so powerful. Hebrews chapter 15 verse, excuse me, Hebrews 13, 15. We're going to read it together. It says, through Jesus, therefore, let us continue to offer to God a sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Do you remember that ugly 80s version song of we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord? You're like, I I didn't say it was a bad song. It was, you know, it's it's a little dated. (laughs) Some of you... Some of you don't remember, even rem- remember, grew up in church and don't remember singing that song. It's how, you know, it's age, it aged like a fine wine. <laughs> right? That's why this next, it's why it's powerful, because it's a, sacri- it's a sacrifice of praise. In other words, I'm, I'm proclaiming how good he is, even though right now I can't see how good he is. I don't feel how good he is. But I, gratitude is a response. And it's a response that trumps how I feel. Mm-hmm. It's a declaration that means it doesn't matter what I'm going through. I'm going to continue to praise him. Um, I'm, not, I'm not friends with Bill or Benny Johnson by any means. And I don't know them. But I got to watch his first sermon after she lost her battle with cancer. And he came before Bethel, there, Bethel Redding there in California. He came before Bethel and he, he preached like, like as in she had passed, I think, a couple days before, four days before. And he stood before his congregation and he said, I'm going to offer a sacrifice of praise and I'm going to minister to you and minister before the Lord because this is the only time I will get to bring this sacrifice to God. Think about it. We're going to spend eternity with Jesus. And we can bring him all kinds of praise and all kinds of worship. But in heaven, sacrifice will be over. So the only time that I'm able to bring him a sacrifice of praise 
is here. And that, that includes declaring he is good and he is heavenly father. When I don't see it, when I don't feel it, when the prayer didn't come through, when the breakthrough didn't happen, I'm bringing before my God the sacrifice of praise. When we're exhausted, when we're hurting, sometimes worship and expressing gratitude is the last thing we want to do. I want you to look with me in Luke chapter 17. I'm going to paraphrase most of this story because there's a, there's a deeper context here that I'll get to later, hopefully later in the year, should the Lord allow. There were 10 lepers who called to Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. If you remember the story, go to Luke chapter 17. I'm going to turn there with you. It's important enough. Let's get there. Eric's got the latter half. Don't worry. He's on top of it. We communicated this morning. Luke chapter 17, verse 11 says this. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going to a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. And they stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. In verse 14, when he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. There's some other context there, but we'll leave it. And as they went, they were cleansed. Verse 15 says, And one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, what? Praising God in a loud voice, and he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Let's stop right here for just a second. He sees ten men. They cry out for mercy. He knows they're asking him to heal them from leprosy, which at that point in time, was a death sentence it was also meant excommunication from the community it also normally at that point in time traditionally that was that that sin was associated with the curse of leprosy you got me so this is you are you are excommunicated and cut off socially you are excommunicated and cut, cut off spiritually and you were excommunicated and cut off really familial done you, you have the only people you're in any sort of relationship with or in friendship socially at all is other lepers who are we are all going to die the same nasty horrible death right verse 15 and 16 let me just reread these real quick it says one of them when he saw that he was healed came back praising God in a loud voice and he threw himself at Jesus's feet and thanked him and he was a Samaritan only one returned to give thanks praising God through throwing himself at Jesus's feet Here's one thing that I need you to understand, and understand it as we move forward. You can clap during worship and praise. And you know what? You don't even have to be on beat. We are blessed to have a very talented drummer and beatboxer, and they're both sitting right there. It just so happens if we put Rick on the drums this morning, we would be deaf in about five minutes. Maybe less. Maybe less. <laughs> Challenge accepted. When you're, when you're in worship, when you're in praise, and you're crying out in a loud voice, why would I want to stop praise and worship? When you're engaged in praise and worship, you're not praise and worship in me. Man, I don't want to move you out of time with Dad. Because for some people, that's the only time with Dad you're giving yourself all week. It's really hard to stand up here. I'm not, I'm not asking for, uh, let me put it this way. I'm not asking for your forgiveness. I'm just telling you from a pastor's heart, when I see you engaged in praise and worship, we'll just table the rest of this meeting. We'll just do that. Amen. Come on. He stops. Now, I want you to understand something. Jesus doesn't need gratitude, but it did something for the man. In verse 17, it reads this. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, for your faith has made you well. That word well there is actually the Greek word soso. His body had been healed, but there was something about his praise and his thankfulness, right? His gratitude, his demonstration of faith that then took him from healed to whole. Amen. How many of you know there might be tragedy and circumstances by which your heart might be healed, but you are not whole? 
If you go, well, I don't know that I believe in that. My, Luke chapter 17, verses 17 through 19 is, is where I'm pointing at this morning, is that you and I might physically be healed, meaning it might physically be operational. It might work well. It might work at a livable rate. But you, the, here's the thing, are, is it whole? Are, have you been made whole? And maybe the key this morning to understanding wholeness is to bring him a sacrifice of praise. One of the hardest things I've ever seen, never mind, I, just, I can't go there. Psalm chapter 50 verse 23 says this, he who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. And to him and to him who orders his way right, I will show him the salvation of God. Let's take 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. I, I talked about this earlier. But you're a chosen people. Who do you belong to? I've, th- three people answered. Come on. Who, who do you belong to? I want you to say it like you mean it and stop smiling at me because you don't belong to me. Who do you belong to? Who do you belong to? Whose are you? When you take communion, when we take communion, it is a declaration saying, I belong to Him. This morning, the piano didn't work. I'm serious. You're like, what does that have to do with communion? We didn't take communion for the piano. We didn't pour communion on the piano because then it really wouldn't work. But we went over there and I said, Lord, it don't work. Fix it. And about five seconds later, after Mike and I prayed for it, it worked. You go, why do you do that? Because it belongs to Him. And this service belongs to Him. And the worship and thanksgiving belong to Him. And you and I belong to Him. There you go. Good job. Yeah. Well, all right. Now we have church. Amen. We belong to Him. Right? You're a royal priesthood but you are a chosen people you are what a royal priesthood so then why in the world are we walking around like paupers when he calls us royal (laughs) we're walking around like slaves and he says your sons ladies your your daughters but you're in there right you're a royal rick's getting happy You're a what? What's the next one? You're a holy nation. You're God's special possession. Or that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Okay. Now how many of you believe this? I do. Well... I'm not trying to highlight you, but if you didn't have your hand up, that shows me where we're at. I know, stare at the wall, don't say it to anybody, (laughs) lest they get offended. There's a lot of people who don't believe that. There's a lot of people who struggle with this declaration that Peter makes. And he says, but you are a chosen people. Why would God choose me? I don't know. I've seen me, I'm not sure why he chose me, but I'm glad he did. Come on. Look, you're a royal priesthood. You've, li- listen to me. That's a declaration that we've been made royal and you're in the family of royalty. Come on. Yeah. Right? Do you know what it means to be a priesthood? That, that means that the sacrifice of praise is to be ministered to by the priest. Or can I say priestess? Are you okay with that? Let's take these two verses and let's put them together. So as believers underneath this new covenant, we now have the privilege of ministering to the Lord. When we offer up a sacrifice of praise, we are bringing honor to God. Focusing our hearts on gratitude brings Him glory, which is good. But the Bible goes on to explain that gratitude also reorients us correctly, inviting the salvation of God into our lives. I can't take and minister for you 
your sacrifice of praise. You can't take and do so for me. Together, we take a sacrifice before the Lord and minister a sacrifice of praise to Him. You can do this corporately. You can do this privately. Sometimes praise costs us stuff. But it's when we come before Him with gratitude and thanksgiving. And listen to me. Gratitude and thanksgiving sometimes look like faith. How many of you knew if you could, if you knew what the circumstance that you were up against and we talked about just a few minutes ago that we lifted our hand and we brought before him but then we took it back with us? If we left it with him knowing how it would work out, it wouldn't be called faith anymore. Mm -hmm. Listen to me, it would cease to be a sacrifice So there are situations where all of us we're, we're, that we're encountering right now, you go, I don't know how this is going to work out. So Father, I choose to praise you in the middle of the storm because I'm not sure where it's going. And that's a sacrifice of praise. Last thing this morning, last posture, and then we're going to take communion together. We want to take communion with celebration. Sometimes we can get so sober we're somber and, and sometimes we, we kind of miss like that communion is also to be a celebration. It's a time to tell a testimony. It's a time to talk about how good he's been, how faithful he's been. It's a time to bring him a sacrifice of praise that I don't know that I understand everything on how it's going to go but I'm going to celebrate him and what his sovereignty means and what he's going to do for me, right? It doesn't mean I always know what he's going to do for me. It doesn't mean that it's always going to work out to the way that I plan to break through to work. You know what I'm saying? You ever had an unanswered prayer? It was not just a Garth Brooks song. You ever had an unanswered prayer that didn't go your way when it finally got answered? And it felt like God left you holding the bag all there by yourself? Oh, oh now, now he's gone to meddling. Come on. I'm going to declare praises to his name. Even though it doesn't go my way. And I'm going to choose to celebrate communion as a declaration of how good he is and how faithful he's been. And I'm going to come to him in gratitude and in thankfulness and I'm going to worship God. And you know what? Where you and I just see a bread and a cup and we take things soberly, the enemy sees bombs going off, strongholds coming down, demons dying on the floor. It's warfare. Come on. When we take communion, it is a chance to celebrate with our church family that Jesus changed our lives, and that deserves a party. Amen. When I think about the Lord, how he changed me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he saved me or healed me, I don't, whichever, I'll start putting words in for you if you want to go, go rogue on it. How he saved me to, to the uttermost or how he healed me to the uttermost. Both apply. How he picked me up, how he turned me around, and how he set my feet on solid ground makes me want to shout. And that shout and that declaration is an affront. It is an affront It is an affront to the enemy. It is an affront to that sickness and disease that's been ravaging your body. It is an affront to, and a plague, right, to anxiety and to fear and to frustration. It is an affront to the kingdom and the enemy. And he cannot stand when you'll choose to praise him. Yes. 
Some of you don't know me, but that happens sometimes. There's something about the corporate body of Christ taking the blood and body together of Jesus. Communion is not just a vertical realignment, a covenant establishing with Christ, but it's also a horizontal realigning with the body of Christ. Here's the thing. God loves unity. He loves unity. Loves it. As a matter of fact, you cannot spell communion without the word union. He loves it so much it's his idea. I want to... There was a word that came to the, to the church early this morning, and I want to share it, and I want to close with this right before we take communion here. Give me just a second. Like a jeweler looks at every facet deep within a diamond, when you know every part of me, you know who you are, for you are mine. You are made in my image. And some of you think that I cannot redeem your past or your present situations. I am able. I am healer. I am the lover of your soul. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I am the one who calls you to me, whose voice cries to you in the darkest moments, saying, trust me, give me your burdens, your dreams, and your whole heart. I have already paid for all of it. For just, excuse me, for just half, you just have to open your heart your hands in, my, in, the, in spirit to my truth and receive it. The Lord says he loves you with an everlasting love and nothing will ever separate you from it. I am calling you to righteousness through intimacy with me. As one longs to know everything about in me, there is freedom, redemption, wholeness, safety, and peace. One of the I am's, and I want to close with this right here, one of the I am's, that was very unique about this word that came into the church early, early this morning was this. I am your kinsman redeemer. If you're not familiar with the story of Ruth and Boaz, there's this little book after the book of Joshua, Judges, it goes into Ruth. And the story of Ruth actually takes place during one of the times of the Judges. In the book of Ruth, it's the story of Boaz as a type of Jesus character who is our kinsman redeemer. And I want to read this to you this morning. It says, historically and culturally, he was a male relative who helps a weaker relative in need or in danger. The Bible says that he is an avenger in the case of manslaughter. The Bible says that the kinsman redeemer's job was he was a deliverer, he was a rescue, rescuer, and that he is a redeemer. There are some of us in the room this morning we have very foolishly believed a lie. And here's what I mean. We've believed a lie that says that there is nothing about my past, there is nothing in my present, right, that is redeemable. And we have allowed the enemy to minister this hopelessness that when we go back and we visit our past or we visit our present situation or we think about our future, that God is absent of it, that he hasn't really saved us from it, and that he cannot do anything with it. And the whole, the whole one of the big ideas with God being a kinsman redeemer is that he is able to take our past and redeem it for his purpose and future. What most people don't know or have forgotten about is there's this little hidden gem found in Matthew chapter 1, Verse five, you go, if, you're, if you know your Bible, you know that I am turning you to Matthew's genealogy of Jesus. If you'll notice, ladies, three of you are present. There are three ladies t in, in the genealogy of Christ. Tamar, who was an adulteress. Rahab, who was a prostitute and Ruth, who was a pagan Moabitess. God loves redemption. Amen. Amen. If you visited your past or thought about your future and can't get over your present, I would suggest to you this morning that while you take communion, you remember that you're taking communion and you've made covenant with the kinsman redeemer. 
And that there's nothing that you've been through, nothing that you've been through, he cannot use to his glory and his purpose and his will for your life. Nothing, nothing. It doesn't matter how ugly it is. It doesn't matter how ugly it gets. I want us to sit here and take a minute and I want us to think soberly about this communion. Some of you need a covenant check. Father, am I in covenant with you? And Lord, if I'm not, I repent right now in the name of Jesus. I repent for where I've allowed the enemy to tell me I'm irredeemable. I repent for visiting my past and not bringing you with me so that you could show me where you had me covered. Father, I repent for where my pride has led me to stupid decisions without you. Father, I repent right now in the name of Jesus for any sin that separates me from you. And be, the, because the Bible says, if I am faithful, if, if I will confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me of all unrighteousness, leaving only Jesus' righteousness, which he purchased through the, the body and the blood and the covenant, that I'm seen and restored to relationship with you as a son and as a daughter, that I'm declared worthy, that I'm declared a royal priesthood, and Father, I choose to bring you right now a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. I choose to bring you a past. I choose to bring you my present. I choose to bring you my future. I choose to trust you. With the stuff that I don't know about, Father, I choose to trust you. Ushers, if you would head back to the communion table and make it ready for us. Now, thankfully, says this. When I think about the Lord, when I think about how he saved me, When I think about how he healed me, when I think about how he filled me with his Holy Ghost, and he healed me to the uttermost, oh, it makes me want to shout. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory and all of the honor and all the praise. Father, there are those of you in the room, there are those of us in the room, we bring before you a sacrifice of praise. We bring before you a situation and a circumstance. We don't know the outcome, or we know the outcome and it didn't go according to our plan. It didn't go according to, this, to what we believed you would do, but we declare you good. We bring before you a sacrifice of praise. Because we praise you even though we might have lost a relationship. And we praise you even though we might have lost a loved one. And we praise you even though we're still contending and praying for healing. And we praise you even though justice wasn't done. We praise you even though mercy wasn't satisfied. 
We praise you even though the circumstance is still left undone. We declare you good. We declare you holy. We declare you sovereign. And once more as this prophetic act, we just come before you with an open hands and we release it to you right now in the name of Jesus. And in your own voice right now, if that's you, would you just... Would you just begin to worship him? Would you just begin to thank him? Would you just begin to declare right now? Oh, I want you out loud, loud enough that you can hear yourself. Father, I lift, this, lift up this circumstance to you. And even though I don't know what it is, I declare you good. Father, I worship you and I praise you, even though it didn't go my way. I worship you and I praise you and I declare you good and I declare you faithful. And I will not let the enemy take my, I, my eyes off of you. I will keep my eyes on you. I will keep my focus on you, Jesus. I will declare your wonders and I will declare your works, and I will testify of your goodness. We're going to do something special today, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to take communion together, so I'm just going to give you a second to go do that. I want, to, I want you to go get the elements, and I want you to come, or just really quickly turn around, get back to your seat as, as quickly and as orderly as possible. We're going to take communion together this morning, so I just want you to hold it when you get back to your seat. And if someone could remember Eric and Pastor Steve. Again, we're going to take it together this morning, so just... Grab it and come back to your seat. Someone could remember Pastor Steve and Eric. Pastor Steve is good. If somebody could remember Eric. He's, Eric's good. Praise the Lord. God's healed you in the last two weeks, would you stand? If he's healed you, if he's touched you, if, he's, if you got better and he healed you in the last two weeks, would you stand? All right, you have less than a minute to testify to his goodness this morning. Rick, go, go for it. Yeah, that ankle was shattered, right? And it has rods and pins in it and everything else. And you had zero mobility. And when we saw you, you started attending 970 Church. You were coming to us with a cane. And that was about six, eight weeks ago. 
and now you are walking without a cane you have increased range of mobility in that ankle because of Jesus Amen. there you go Ryan come on the Lord loves prosperity tales too praise the Lord awesome praise God Susan Come on, give God a hand clap this morning. Diane. You can walk normal now. Absolutely. Okay, so let's stop right here. Yes, that's powerful. If you're around Diane right now, would you lay hands on her? Because we're going to believe for a complete healing and not just a slow down. Your hands are full. Well, don't lay the communion cup on her. <laughs> Smash your bread into her in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for what you're doing and we give you the glory and the honor and the praise, Jesus. Now, we, we command cancer to be gone in the name of Jesus. Not just to be slowed, but to be, to be gone, to disappear, for that body to be made whole in the name of Jesus right now. Somebody else was, st Marie, you were standing for testimony this morning. It's gone. So hand fully restored. Almost. All right. This thumb. What thumb? The Lord loves thumbs. I have it on good authority. <laughs> it's healed. It's healing. It's an active process. We declare it healed, Father, in the name of Jesus, because I can't hear what she's saying. Touch her, Father. Look, here's the thing. When we come before the Lord, it's a time of testimony, right? And you go, listen, we got to take time for the testimony for what he's done. Why? Because when you, when you declare what he's done and how good he is, you send the enemy on the run in the name of Jesus. It also tells us, the Lord is still in the miracle working business, right? Do it again, Father. Let's take communion together. Does it, does, has everybody been served elements that needed elements? Got them. All right. Some of you are praying for healing because you haven't seen the breakthrough totally come yet. So we're praying for you right now. If you, if you would do this, grab the bread for me. If you need a healing, right, I want you to lift your arm in the air as high as you can. Father, you see every hand lifted in this place. That even while we're in communion, we are establishing and reestablishing covenant with you. Don's going to stop playing here for just a second. We got it together. It's together. In the name of Jesus right now, for every, for every, every physical need in this place to be brought into alignment with the, with the body of Jesus Christ that was broken for us. We take it together right now in the name of Jesus. Grab the cup for me. I want you to place your hand over your heart this morning. Lord, when we came into this new covenant established through the blood of Jesus Christ, you took out a heart of stone and you replaced it with a heart of flesh. A heart that was united, one with you in covenant. And we remind ourselves this morning of that covenant. We remind ourselves that we are a covenant people, that we're in covenant with a covenantial God, that it is relational, that it is not transactional, Father. We remind ourselves this morning that we are in covenant with one another as a body of Christ. 
We remind ourselves this morning that we have brothers and sisters and other expressions of, of other denominations and other faiths that we're in covenant with, united by the blood of Jesus this morning. Mm. We take this together in remembrance of you and declare it till the day you come back for us. Go ahead, guys, take. Just the voices. When I think about the... I can't get there. Hi, you're going to have to help me. How How he saved me. How he raised me. How he filled me with the Holy Ghost. How he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord. How he picked me up and turned me around. How he placed my feet on solid ground. It makes me, it makes me want to shout hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. It makes me want to shout. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. When I think about the Lord, how He saved me, how He raised me, how He filled me, With the Holy Ghost, how He healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how He picked me up and turned me around. How He placed my feet on solid ground. It makes me want to shout. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. It makes me want to shout, Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory. And all the honor and all the praise. It makes me want to shout hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. It makes me want to shout Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. Let me bless you. I I know you want to shout, but I'm going to bless you. Father, we love you and we declare your praises and your goodness and your faithfulness this morning. We thank you for the body of Christ. Your son Jesus was broken and and bruised and bloodied for us. We thank you for establishing a new covenant. We thank you for the ability to come before you soberly and thankfully and celebrate what you've done through, through that covenant of Jesus right now. We thank you for the testimonies that were shared in this place. And we pray that they would continue and Lord, that you would increase more in the name of Jesus. More for this valley in the name of Jesus. We bless right now every, every small and large business owner that you would continue to bless and pour out favor and pour out blessing, that your name would be proclaimed even in the world and area of business, Lord, especially through the world and area of business right now. Lord, I pray right now that you would come before, that you would come behind, that this week you would come alongside, that you would open doors, that you would close doors, that we would follow you sovereignly. Lord, just you're in charge. We put our faith in you. We put our trust in you. Lord, we pray for breakthrough of miracles, healing, stuff that 
would make the book of Acts shudder when we think about how great and powerful you are. It's in your holy and precious name we pray this morning. Amen. So be it. Well, I want to bless you. We just did that. But yeah, the rest of it is come hang out. Um, You've got a few few minutes. Shake your hand.